for the first time to be in a committee when you're uh, in the chair. We're normally side by side on the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, so uh, slight rules uh, being changed this morning. Can I also pay tribute to the Honourable Gentleman for Wimbledon for bringing this timely debate uh, and say to the government that it shouldn't really be in this uh, time of national crisis and national debate for backbench members of parliament to have to bring debates to Westminster Hall on something so critical. Mm. Um, if it is about Quite taking right. back control, then parliament should be debating this every yeah, yeah. single day of every single oh, week so that yeah, the public yeah. can yeah. have a real view about where we are heading as a country uh, towards uh, the exit from the uh, European Union. And I think we're now in a debate, quite clearly, which is now no longer about staying in the EU, but about the least worst option of when we leave. Uh, and the arguments that the Honourable Gentleman from Wimbledon has put forward this morning quite clearly demonstrates that this is one of the options that the government could choose in order to ensure that we have the least worst exit from the EU. Um, the government's own leaked, not leaked, written, not published, whatever analysis has been done uh, by the government shows that some of these issues show uh, that it is the least worst option. So why would the government uh, not take them? And as I say, uh, consistently when I speak in the, uh, the main chamber or indeed Westminster Hall or indeed the newspaper <coughs> articles, whether you agree with these arguments or not, the very fact the government have taken them off the table shows that the direction of the government is towards a place that will damage fundamentally for generations to come uh, the UK uh, economy. And it's quite clear as well uh, to anyone who follows this debate with any kind of detail that the goals and aims and objectives that the government have set themselves when leaving the European Union are completely and utterly incompatible and indeed incoherent with the red lines that they've set themselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you want to achieve a trade deal with the European Union, if you want to maintain tariff-free, frictionless access, if you want to ensure that the issues around Northern Ireland are resolved, if you want regulatory harmonisation, if you want to be able to stay in European programmes such as Erasmus and Horizon, <laughs> I represent a, a city, Edinburgh University uh, has issued their annual report. I say to the minister, go to the two back pages of that annual report where they get their research funding from, and there's page after page after page tens of millions of pounds that come from the European Union. And if you want to achieve all of those uh, objectives, and I've no doubt the government do want to achieve all of those objectives, I suggest they reach out, they keep everything on the table, uh, and they say to Parliament when it's taking back control that the best way to achieve all of these issues is through EFTA, EEA, Single Market, Customs Union, whichever way you want to look at it. But let's keep them on the table and have uh, those arguments. And the reason that EFTA is so important is because it's about economic integration between its members. And the EEA allows that economic integration between the EFTA members and the European Union. That seems to me very similar to the goals and objectives that the Prime Minister set out in both her Lancaster House and Florence speeches. Um, we do want free and frictionless trade. We do want that regulatory harmonisation. We do want it to include goods and indeed services, as my honourable uh, friend from Streatham uh, mentioned. Is this, um, because it's not CETA, as has been mentioned by the honourable gentleman from Wimbledon, is this CETA plus, plus, plus uh, that the uh, Secretary of State for exiting the European Union was uh, mentioning a few weeks ago? I'm happy to give way. I thank more of for giving way uh, very generously. Uh, he's making an excellent speech. Um, would you agree with me that the particular problem that the government have got themselves into is that instead of keeping all the options open, as he says, um, the Prime Minister is instead having to, uh, on a quite a reactionary basis, um, respond to those extremists in her own party and close off options at exactly the time when we should be exploring the possibilities of all the options yeah. that are there and what's the best way forward for the country? And my honourable friend hits the nail on the head with this argument. This government is not looking at the best possible option for exiting the European Union. They're trying to resolve a decades-long problem in their own party, uh, which is now raising its ugly head again, uh, as we've seen in the newspapers uh, in the last few weeks. And I do uh, firmly believe that many members, many senior members of the government, indeed many senior influential, uh, influential members in the government backbenches, would rather see the UK fall off a cliff to achieve their own ideological goals and take control of their own party uh, than do what's in the best interest of the country. Uh, Mr Gapes, I will wrap up because people do want to speak, but I don't want to wrap up uh, with this. EFTA is the ninth largest trading partner in the world in goods and the seventh largest trading partner in the world in services. It's the third largest trading partner with the EU in terms of goods and the second in terms of services. 
If that deal was put on the table to the United Kingdom today from Michel Barnier, we should bite his hand That's off right. to take it. It's on the table, yeah. it's here, yeah. it's ready-made, yeah. and the government would be having a massive dereliction of duty if it didn't at least consider the option of staying in EFTA. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah.